And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us from Unlimited Online and D3 Gaming, the one and only Damien Willis. How you doing today, man? Doing great, man. I figure like I need applause. I'm glad that you said drunk because I've been sipping on Korean soju this whole time. <laughs> uh, look, I'll, I'll, ha I'll give, give me a few bottles of Summit any day of the week. But if I usually don't drink, but I, I went out to a Korean barbecue joint and they had a, a blueberry soju, which is like a Korean uh, rice wine. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal, good stuff. Yeah, ri rice wines are rice wines are good though. Appar apparently my family thinks I'm crazy for for being it for because of how, because of how often I've had sake. Oh, why why would that be crazy, man? Oh, that's delicious. I I don't know. Maybe there maybe there are a bunch of rookies who only know only know how to handle light beer. <laughs> um Yeah, I think there's 12% in this thing. I'm good. Mm -hmm. Happy. The on the only thing I'm not touching is the is the really bitter beer. Oh, no no, IPAs and things of that nature, double IPAs. I'm I'm good. Oh, of course. Of course, I've, I've got no shortage of choice given given that I'm from given that I'm from the Midwest. <laughs> <laughs> I get some some of the people on the East Coast seem to seem to have this idea that they're the beer capital of the U.S. No, no, that well, no, that's not. Maybe maybe you can think so with with the with those fi with those fancy ass craft beers, but no. Man, you can get alcohol no matter what. Now, as far as consumption goes, I think Louisiana has something to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> that the LSU fans don't play around. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, and I've I I found it especially hilarious that in New in New Orleans you can get you can get you you can get your own parade. Oh yeah. Oh, uh, have you heard about the drive-through daiquiris? You can go in your car and get alcohol through a drive-through window. <laughs> <laughs> I I haven't, but that but I'll but I'll have to look into that the next time I'm in the Big East. Dude, I I literally have one about three minutes from my house. <laughs> <laughs> On a hard day's work, coming back home, that's it. You stop and get you a daiquiri. Yeah, but I usually start these with the humble beginnings. So, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. Well, um, uh, it's. I was a nerd, <laughs> like pretty bad in high school and uh, middle school. So, you know, I was a private school kid, so I didn't have a whole lot of friends when I went to public school and in, in, in high school. So I ended up meeting a, a group of friends, and that first they introduced me to Dungeons and Dragons, and uh, we were rolling Thaco and doing all that stuff. And throughout the four years of that, we've always hung out. We would always do every weekend, go to a friend's house, and we'd play, you know, stay the night. And so we were heavily into it. So it was a creative outlet. Uh, I've always loved to write, always loved to draw. And then uh, after that, I went to college for engineering and art. And me, like a stupid, I chased the art instead of the engineering because I wanted to do something fun. But, um, you know, um, being here in the South, you're kind of in a hole when it comes to creative uh, jobs. So um, we've had an idea to do our own tabletop game for about six years now. We've been working on this project for about four. So um, we sat around. I'm like, look, let me get the paperwork drawn up. Let's make this for real. So we've been working on this for about four years. We're probably about six months out uh, before we hit the print. And it's been a, a wild ride. <laughs> Has, you ever heard the term uh, burning the candle at both ends? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and were, were you... Now, when it comes to, since you mentioned since you mentioned Thaco, let me take a little bit of a stab in the dark. You got your start with AD and D second. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I kind of I kind of suspected that was the case. Yeah, I'm, I'm a lot older than I sound. I guess I, I get that all the time. I'm I'm I'm, I'm like I'm 43. So yeah. we started um, rolling dice when we were probably 12, 13 years old. And then consuming comic books and anime came along after that. So any creative medium that was, you know, different, we kind of stuck to it. So we tried our hand at um, uh, Vampire the Masquerade. We did some um, 
Shadow Run. Uh, I loved it. And then we've always kind of liked the mix of fantasy. We did some D20 Modern as well. That was a pretty good system. Uh, Marvel had one. And so we just wanted to do something that was kind of a combination of all that cool stuff. So that's where our project was born. And so we do have, um, you know, we have a modern setting and a fantasy setting within the same, I guess, uh, source material, same rule books. Mm -hmm. And how many pounds of D6s? <laughs> it's going to be quite a bit because rolling damage, we, you know, it's always pretty epic and you, you, you plan out a character and then you min max and then you get out there and you, you, you shoot a spell and you roll like eight D6s. So um, that's pretty exciting. Then the power creep is really exciting. So with our game, um, you know, you'll have a weapon that does your damage with enchantments plus skills. And then on top of that, your stats. So you'll you'll be you'll be getting a lot of <laughs> a lot of damage. But we'll use the standard, uh, you know, d20, d12s, d8s, d you know, d4s, all that kind of stuff. So players that jump into our game won't have to buy anything new that they wouldn't already have playing D and D or uh, something like that. Mm -hmm. And the th now given now given that. Um, was was talking to him, talk me through how the how the concept of unlimited online came to be okay um well i wanted to do a fantasy game my brother wanted to do a um and my twin i have a twin brother i'm damien his name is damon and that's uh, the, the third part of uh d3 so d3 is damien damon and dustin mm -hmm. so uh we've all been to high school together we've known each other since we were in knee high and um as we kind of cultivated this whole thing over you know years of friendship so um the idea behind the game is that you you are a person that lives on earth years are approximately 2069 so with all the innovations we're having with ai and clean energy people aren't having to work so much uh, automation's becoming a thing so let's say you, you run a job you only have to show up three days out of the week well, that leaves a lot of empty time for you to express yourself either through inventions or going to college and, you know, higher learning. Mm -hmm. So with all this time, more uh, things are being invented, but there um, things are moving so quickly that not everything is uh, sanctioned. So we're at the cusp, our, our world's at the cusp of um, going to a cyberpunk era where you might have flying cars and all this, but we still have that same familiar infrastructure that we're used to. So this leaves open a brand of storytelling where players can kind of rewrite laws or um, change the environment to suit whatever they want to do and then take some creative freedoms on uh, what technologies are being um, developed in that nature. So the Unlimited Online Engine was a AI that was written to create fantasy worlds. So it was eventually it was initially created to make video game worlds. So the the scientists that made this system, it was stolen through corporate espionage and then it leaked to the public. So it was untested and went out into the public and people started logging into this world called Gaia. It turns out that the world Gaia is a little bit more robust than people thought it would be. So you have players logging into this world and experiencing these things and then when they come back to Earth, some of these things follow them back. So you you want to, you know, as the mystery breaks down, is this real? Is it not real? Is it a game? It's all um, left up to the player to kind of make a decision or write their stories to see what is real and what's not. Now we do have um, a series of books planned for the progression of the way the world will eventually go. But at the initial stage, we want that mystery of if, if this is real or is it not? Is it a game or is it not? Um, but without giving away too much spoilers, there's there's some pretty cool stuff that's going on that would allow players to take things from Gaia and bring it back to the real world and affect how things play out there. Mm -hmm. Now, this is, this is where there's a bit of an interesting thing that, that I see going on, and that is... That you're that you're making both a character and an avatar. Right. So you make a character. Just think about how you wake up and you go to work every morning. So you pick your occupation. With that comes how much money you make, and you have an apartment or whatnot. You get to pick um, through character creation a set of perks and flaws. So you can 
pick more perks uh, you pick flaws to get more points to pick perks which will include things like having extra money or having a car uh, it'll be a, a whole list of uh, anything from physical to role-playing uh, type skills so when you make this character this character is going to be taking part of um, the mystery that's happening on earth it'll be more the kind of like spy corporate espionage things so all the skills on this character are going to be more role-playing skills so you will have some martial arts and marksmanship stuff and some swordsmanship stuff, but you'll you'll have things like hacking. Excuse me, I got a phone call. Let me put that out okay. there. And then when you log into Gaia, it'll be an avatar that you create a species. So you can pick an elf, dwarf, and a plethora of others. But we're we're also allowing people to create hybrids. So as you level up, each species has a list of traits. And you can mix and match those traits when you get points to pick how you want to develop that character. And with the avatar, you also pick a class. So you have the standard classes like, um, you know, priest, fighter, um, a thief, scientist, that kind of thing. And then that's where all of your combat skills um, develop through those character classes. Now, the interesting thing is, is that while you're in Gaia, you have access to all these and all the skills of your human counterpart, because essentially you're logging into a game with your, your mind and your consciousness, so you have access to all that. Now, when you come back to Earth, those skills and things of that avatar are, are kind of left in the other plane, unless you summon it. So, through resource management like Mana, you're able to summon that avatar and do some pretty incredible things in our modern world that shouldn't happen <laughs> so um that skill is is kind of like an oh shit moment when you see it happen so it's not something that will happen all the time or we'll be able to be maintained indefinitely but in short bursts it could be something that would turn the tide of a battle mm -hmm. so le so within within that one there, there's a few things that i um i noticed and i do want to thank you for the care package you had sent my way no, no problem. Um, so the first thing, first the first thing I wanted to get into is what exactly focus skills entails, because you have you have combat skills and you have focus skills, as well as well as the physical tech and me and mental skills. But focus okay. one is the one I wanted to I wanted to well focus on for the purposes of this. Um, focus skills are, are, are mostly going to be like your passive skills. So th that would include things like running, jumping, or um, some kind of uh, weightlifting or something that would augment stats and things of that nature. So we wanted to just make a, um, I guess, a division between combat skills and passive skills. There's a lot of video game elements um, in the game because eventually, uh, initially, we were developing it to make a video game, but we're getting our feet wet, so we're gonna start up and then basically lay the whole plan down in a tabletop RPG, and then move up from there as, as funds uh, allow us to. Mm -hmm. So um, you can just think of them as passive skills, not necessarily stat sticks, because some of these focus skills might, um, they're probably more RP uh, oriented. Mm -hmm. So the other, the other thing is, I see, I do see you have your your own version of a basic six set of um, of abilities, but you also have three aptitudes, and I'm cur I'm curious if it's a case where where one where um, one pair cascades from the other. Correct. So in the real world, you have your um, your three aptitudes, and when you level up, you get points, and then. You can put a point into each aptitude, and then that filters down to the the stats. So, the, when you build your player in the uh, Earth realm, those stats are transferred over to your avatar. So, though they're kind of just a stat stick that helps that avatar get better based on how you develop your player in the real world. So, um, with your your physical, mental, and and spiritual stats, you basically have your HP, your willpower, and um, your mana. And willpower is a, um, and I'll, willpower is like um, inspiration, kind of like in D and D. You can kind of use it to re-roll things, to gain HP in a pinch, or to regain mana in a pinch. Um, but also, if you zero out, you're no longer able to log into Gaia or um, manifest your avatar. Mm -hmm. So willpower is something that you get back when you sleep or when you let your mind rest. So it's kind of like a fail safe for you to do epic stuff or to not die. <laughs> so um, 
that's how we we broke up those three categories to kind of give the players, uh, I guess, a better understanding of what's going on in our minds. So physical things are more like your HP. Uh, your mental is going to be your willpower. And then you have the spiritual stuff that's going to be your mana. Mm-hmm. So with so within that, when it, now when it comes to when it comes to, when it comes to le- when it comes to leveling, is it is it ma- is it mainly going to be ju- just um, bo- just boosting skill points and then um, and then later on later on or at least a, to a lesser degree boosting your core aptitudes or how how is the relationship going to work and for that matter are you are you even going to be using um, skill points or is it a case of you have it or you don't? Okay, you will be able to develop ranks in the skills. So when you level up, you will get uh, a certain number of stat points and a certain number of skill points. So let's say you have swordsmanship um, rank one. You know, you're basically pretty good with a sword. Um, does an extra d6 of damage when you go to attack. If you decide to put another point into it and get rank two, you get like a, an effect that causes bleeding or something of that nature. And then you can, uh, we have four ranks planned uh, for each skill that we'll have. So players will be able to, let's say if they want to be good at one certain thing or if they want to spread out and be a jack of all trades. And each skill will have um, enticing things that would make people kind of want to double dip into it to make their character more specialized. And that will work with the avatar classes as well you will be able to um, keep those because the way the skill tree works in the avatar classes you start off with a basic um, archetype let's say a warrior and then it branches off into more um, specialized uh, classes and with that you're able to even still invest in the earlier classes to make those skills more relevant and more powerful so we aim to keep everything relevant and not just level up and pick the last thing on the board because it's so overpowered mm-hmm. so with the, with that in with that in mind uh, when it comes to when it, com- when it comes to avatars um, I did notice that instead of ri- instead of writing out the same um, stat list you have Essentially, stats as a hex, and what I'm cu- although you although I do I do have to take that back because you do have the core stats, um, also also, li- also listed out below that. So I'm, I am curious what what ge- what made you want to go with the with this particular hex design hex design for representing the stats. Okay, you're looking at the uh, combat sheet for the avatar? Yeah. Okay. Um, we largely do that we wanted like a video game aesthetic because we wanted to connect with people that are more familiar with things like MMOs and that nature. And so, you know, a lot of the hex stuff, it's, it's you know, it's just a nice way to hold data. <laughs> so um, there really isn't a, a correlation on how it's built other than aesthetics. But the skills, uh, the stats, uh, like say strength, constitution, agility, intelligence, perception, and luck, all of these have secondary things that they do for you. Like strength will allow you to carry more, um, more agility will let you move more feet per round. And of course, constitution's more uh, hit points. Luck will increase your uh, crit multiplier and perception increases your, um, your accuracy. So um, with the way we're looking at it, this character sheet right here, um, Everything is. I'm trying. We tried to put everything up front to where people would be able to understand and have everything at a glance. Mm-hmm. Now, I did look at the species entries and, and the traits that they have. Mm-hmm. Now, when when it comes to the tier system, is it is this just demonstrating what um, what traits that you could access as you le- as you go through the levels? Yes. So, what we we plan on having like a, an initial max level of like level 50. So every, I believe, 10 levels we have, you get an extra uh, freight point that you could spend towards your um, your um, species trait. So if you if you decide to create a um, a hybrid character, let's say you wanted to be a celestial orc, 
you could go you could essentially put points in either one of those trees because you're you're technically both so we we will allow characters either play like i guess a purebred of the species or do a hybrid with two with two characters so it's up to you how you want to proceed down those the trees because some of the 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 tier four skills are, are ridiculous but if you want to be more rounded let's say if you wanted flying from the celestial tree and you, let's say you wanted to pick the fallen and you want to be able to go through walk through shadows or something like that you could you could pick what you want to do and plan that character out mm -hmm. so with that with that in mind um when it comes to when it comes to avatar classes you already you already mentioned the main you already mentioned the main batch but what I am curious about is is what is um how is how is how the features and how you'd get how you'd get them from classes would would work. Okay, I mean you'll go through like a standard leveling process. Um, so we will have charts that will say when you're eligible for these. I believe it's um, every 15 levels that you're able to change and go to a higher class. And with that, it, there there's a quest that there will be um, that the game master is optional if he wants you to go on it. But it's typically going to go to finding someone that's a specialist that you want to turn into and then do a quest for them and then you'll be able to ascend into that and with that it will give you access to um, more mechanics and more skills mm -hmm. so let's say for um, you know let's say the acolyte um, the priest um, if you branch off into the priest you have access to all these deities and gods if you were doing went the other way went to the monk you would have access to the chi mechanic that we have where you're able to actually expand chi to power up your moves mm -hmm. so each archetype uh, kind of has um, their own kind of gimmick um, but let's say for the warrior if you go down the tree to a sword saint you're able to imbue a soul into your weapon and that weapon grows with you mm -hmm. and um, every you know everything is pretty unique in, in an aspect that everything is completely different from what we've been playing before mm -hmm. Uh, just, just remember that. Just remember that. And I, I have, I have to make this joke, but thanks to Moon Knight's Marine Corps training, he can turn anything into a weapon, even this uh -huh. rifle. <laughs> All right. Do you see the um, the warrior tree? There's a brawler and a raider. Mm -hmm. So the brawler's um, one of his signature skills is to basically turn anything to a weapon. So he, he has one skill we have planned called Block Party, where he essentially just throws out a number of random objects, and party members can pick it up and do extra damage with their attacks, or he could just pick up a chair layer and whack you with it. Yeah. So um, we, we kind of have a little bit something for everybody. And to me, what's going to be fun is actually going through the book and trying to min-max and uh, seeing you know what's all different. Um, me, personally, I like the uh, Loa class, which is... Um, it's one of the um, um, the mage classes. Of co of course you would. <laughs> oh, of course I would. Yeah. <laughs> don't think so, don't think you're gonna let that one slip by me. Yeah, come get the voodoo man. I'm kidding. <laughs> but um, essentially, that class is able to take possession of, of of its opponents and and wreck their body from the inside or their soul or steal their mana and do the, those types of things. So we do have a very unique take on, you know, uh, mages and warriors. And I mean, we've, we've added a new scientist class that is able to uh, change their own genetic makeup. And then also an engineering class, which can build, uh, you know, weapons of war and things of that nature. So um, I believe it's a fun time. I, I wouldn't be surprised if eventually you come up with a Cheval build. <laughs> See, like, you know, this, we do plan on doing more. So this is kind of the first installment uh, to get players, you know, get them going. Because we've already have the titles and skill set for the book after. Uh, we're kind of putting the cart before the horse. Um, you know, we did launch our Kickstarter. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have much of a community when we did it. So we learned a lot from that. <laughs> So um, right now we're we're building a community. We're putting out a lot of marketing and things of that nature, and, and everyone that sees it is kind of just floored with it. Yeah. Um, one thing one thing that I am curious about is based based on how based on how the class progression is is performed. Um, is it possible that you could have two people going down this going down the same path, like say go, going down from acolyte to monk to combo master to divine fist? But they're not. But they wouldn't exactly be the same um, coming out of it. 
Correct, because it depends on where you put your ranks and your skills. So let's say there's something in Combo Master that you really like, um, or if there's something really Divine Fist that you like, you can you can invest those points into that. Like um, one of the Divine Fist skills is um, Muscle Memory, where they're able to perform a series of um, attacks without the um, the mana cost and uh, with a greater efficiency because it's just you know they're trained for it so if you put those ranks in that you would be a lot better at that move and doing burst damage so the way that our combat is we do have like these area attack skills and um, you know single attack skills so with our weapons they're categorized with between small medium and large mm -hmm. so small weapons like a dagger you would get three attacks per round on the same target medium-sized weapons like a katana you get two attacks per round and you could split those against two targets and large weapons like a great sword you would basically do uh, an area sweep in front of you everything within five foot with would take damage mm -hmm. so with those um, imbued with enchantments you can pick like if you want to just melt something's face off or if you want to go there and cleave like 20 guys so uh, we tried to add a lot of diversity like I said with the um, like you see in video games and MMOs into a tabletop RPG mm -hmm. and would it, would it be fair to me to say that you are leaning more towards grid combat than theater of the mind correct so um, the grid would be the best thing to keep everything orderly <laughs> So, um, you know, we will put out our own maps as well. Um, just, you know, a nice laminated paper products with some good art. Um, and you can use your imagination or whatever um, terrain that you may have to put on top of that to spruce it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, I can certainly get behind that. Now, when it comes to, when it comes, since you're doing a D20, I'm, I have to ask, um, how do you have criticals work within your system? Is it a case of um, maxed out damage? Is it a case of double damage? How do you how do you um, handle it? Okay, so of course uh, a deep you know rolling a, a natural twenty is a crit. So your crit rates start at a time and a half. So one and a half uh, times damage. If you invest into the luck stat, every time you put a point in luck increases your crit damage. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to play, um, let me pull this up real quick. Down on a thief tree, there's a trickster and gambit. Those characters, uh, I'm sorry, those classes will have skills that will increase their crit range. So you can increase it from 17 to 20. And then if you invest heavily into luck, your crit multiplier is going to be higher. So um, it, 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 it really just depends on how you put your stats down. But you could be possibly doing three times as much damage with a critical. And your crit range is 17 through 20. Of course, these will happen at later late levels, but you can just build a crit monster if you wanted to. Oh, um, I use I usually call them crit fishers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's technically the term, but we can make it that a lot easier. Yeah. <laughs> but and in, and in that in that same in that same vein, um, I'm a bit I'm a bit curious as to where as to. Um, because one one particular trap that hap that happens so often in fantasy games is giving way too much attention to the magic characters. Mm -hmm. You know, we you've you've in D and D third edition there was the issue of um, oh wish. Yeah, <laughs> I I outright had wish banned and as, as well as teleport. <laughs> um, both of those I both of those I had banned from my table because I felt that I felt that they were. Um, that you're, you're essentially doing a blank, a blank check that could be very easy to abuse. Right. So instead, so instead, the approach the approach that I that I took I took was, um, if you if you try if you try and do wish, um, even if, even if even if the spell succeeds, um, it's it's not going to take a spell slot. It's going to take your life. Oh wow, and you're and you're not coming. You're not coming back. So it's a case of, do you really want to use wish? And <laughs> hey, what are you gonna wish for? Because <laughs> what another you, life? Yeah, whatever. Well, you can't. You can't do that. <laughs> It'll just be a waste. <laughs> oh, because the the thing is, is it, it doesn't kill you. You just don't exist. Jeez. Oh, and as far as teleport, the rule that I had was that it. It can be done safely between certain points, between certain ley line points. Oh, that's cool. 
anything after that, and now you're gambling. Yeah. Because because you might let's let's say you want to teleport to the to the town three miles three miles um north. Well, if, well, if it if there is if there isn't that if there isn't that same ley line, or there isn't there isn't a ley line that you can go you can go out of safely, you you might tell you might go to where you were, or you might you might go into somebody's you might end up landing in somebody's house, or you might land where you were planning to just fifty feet in the air. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, the way we plan on dealing with the magic versus melee is that. Um... Instead of doing this, you know, spells per day like you you typically see in D and D, everything will have a, a mana cost and then a cooldown. So, um, as far as as melee, of course, melees are going to be monsters when they're in your face. They'll be a, they have all these extra attacks and then enchantments on their weapons. Whereas if you're a magic user, you're going to be mostly looking at the effects of what your spells do. So. Um, there's a good balance there because you, you're not going to be able to spam, let's say, you know, a fireball 40 times at someone before they can get a chance to get to you. So the way that the the lore is is that when you expend uh, elemental magics and spells, it takes time for those energies to to come back and to fill the void that you've because it's basically it's like creating a vacuum of that magical energy. So smart mages will have to change different. Um, elements in between their attacks to keep things flowing well so it's almost kind of like having a, a rotation in a, um, uh, a an MMO game or something that, of that nature but you'll be able to specialize and 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 do it the way that you want to do it now um, having the, the right amount of points for the mana to spend it and then the willpower to, to fuel all this stuff is going to be um, you know, I think the melee is going to be more face roll, and then your magic user is going to be more of the technical aspect. But they will both be pretty viable. Yeah, the of course, of course, even with that, the one one of the other um, elements that all that always gets that always gets thrown by the wayside is un is unarmed combat. Oh yeah, because because you look at a lot of cases, and it's just sli it's just. Congratulations! You're moving from one d four damage to one d six damage. Yeah, and I've, I've always hated that. I, I've never felt that anyone done has done the monk justice. And I'm a real um, like martial arts guy. I have black belt in taekwondo and all that kind of stuff. And it's just like I always get a case of the red ass when I see them do that because it's really cool stuff. I mean, uh, all the kicks and stuff that you see these guys doing it just you know one d four damage or you knock them unconscious. But well, that, that's just, the other problem. That's the other. Problem and there, there are a handful of there are a handful of games outside of the bubble of the obvious stuff that mm -hmm. ha that handle this. But cons consider this: in if you're if, if you are going if you went to a um, MMA pay per view today, you would yes MMA would be one style that you'd see, but you'd also you would also see sambo. You would see capoeira. Mm -hmm. You well, you might not see capoeira. You you would see Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. You would see Jiu. You would see judo. You might see Shotokan. You might see savat. That was some old pride. Or, um, or um, uh, Muay Thai. And trying to trying to have that all trying to have that all down to ju to just um, to just in to just one d six one d six damage when th when yeah. um, it and this and this whole notion of turning um, f turning martial turning. Um, unarmed combat into a one size fits all always bugs me. Yeah, well, with, with our our monks, we actually have uh, schools of training, so you can go into animal kung fu or you can go into Shotokan, and that's just using word terms. We'll have we'll have our, our own fantastic terms made up for this, but with those schools of um, of learning, you will have different effects. So instead of just doing straight damage, you will have um, you said like stunning fist or something like of that nature. Uh, so you will have the unarmed combat will, will feel fulfilling because you can go to a combo master and string together a couple different schools to get the effects that you want. Um, you know, like if you want to be a debuffer monk where you want to just kidney shot someone, make them go to their knees and then kick them in the face, you can do that. And when I when you one of the, one of the whenever whenever it was brought to me, I'd always say, well, what what if what if the character that I'm that I want to do isn't trying to do the um, language of fist, but rather wants, but rather wants to do internal damage, because that's a, that is a well, that is a well, well, well established motif, of the yes. type of person who will hit you in just the precise spot 
to make to make it hurt worse than it looks. I mean, if everybody is familiar with the with um with my favorite Valentine, roses are red, violets are blue. Omaiwa mo shinderu. <laughs> yeah, uh, Fist of the North Star. I got that. <laughs> uh, are you, the funny thing about the name Fist of the North Star is it's kind of a mistranslation. Um, because the original name Hokuto no Ken isn't supposed to be referencing the North Star, but um, Ursa Major. Gotcha. Um, though if I want a more recent example, I'll use Thunderbolt Fantasy. Oh which, wow! Yeah. Um, which is which is a Wuxia, which is a Wuxia series involving. That's with um, the puppets, right? Yep. Yeah, that was phenomenal. It is. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't. Unfortunately, I can't recommend people go go watch the official release because some because somebody at Crunchyroll fucked up. Mistranslation. Here's here's the thing. Thunderbolt Fantasy was a collaborative project between um P between Peely and Nitro Plus, um, Gendarobuchi's company. And but the the thing is, the version that you're going to be seeing is the Japanese dub of it. With a oh, lot of with a lot of voice actors that th that they're familiar that he's that he's familiar with, inclu including guys like Akio Otsuka, um, who could who could lay, who could lay claim to the Japanese equivalent of the anime dad, or th or the or the anime or the anime vet because, well, his his two his two big roles were um, Archer in the Fate series and the and the um, Seiyu for Solid Snake. Yeah, that's some sexy voices, man. <laughs> um, but and the and the naming conventions you're going to hear are the Japanese translations of all the character names. For some reason, they decided to in the subtitles in the official version, they decided to use the Taiwanese names. What? Why would they do that? I have no idea, but because of that, I can't recommend the official version <laughs> and I tell people go to the fan subs. So I, I love the Chinese naming conventions. It's like, who's the hero? Oh, that that's hero. Well, who's the bad guy? Devil. <laughs> like the Storm Riders, the the naming convention with Cloud and uh, and Wind and all that. I, I loved it. Uh, the whole hero thing even go. Did you ever read a tale of no name? Uh, is that the uh, Man Called Hero series or no? No, a tale of no name is a prequel to Storm Riders that goes into the backstory of Nameless. Oh wow! No, I need to get that. It's it's going to be tricky to get. It was it was a light novel in three volumes that um, like a lot of like a lot of the comics one stuff is out of print. Yeah. I mean, you might you might have you might have some luck get, getting it, but it's not going to be easy. But I'll look on therightstuff.com. They might still have it. They they have a huge warehouse. Yeah. But it is it is an interesting bit, and one and one of the things that was tricky to translate is that you have two characters named Hero, but with the but with different characters in the spelling of it. <laughs> Let's make things difficult now. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I look at I look at some of the other pro, some of the other progressions that, that I see. Um, it did it did some it did somewhat amu it did somewhat amuse me to see. To see that you have, you have the you have the ranger as a you have the ranger as a potential, but what I f but I get the feeling that you're not going to fall into the same trap that rangers have fallen into in more popular games because the ranger has been cursed since the days of AD and D. Yeah, I mean, in those are, it's n it's never been confirmed, but it's suspected that. Um, because the state of the ranger in AD and D is the reason why, um, at death's door rules were were put in, because ranger down became a running joke. <laughs> it's it's largely due to the fact that they can't equip heavy armor, and Thaco relies heavily on armor to make sure you don't get hit. Yeah. So because so because of that, they would they would end up getting kind of squishy and worse. Is that as things would go on, anything they could do, druids could do better. And oh wow! Mo and more. Yeah, I I'm actually playing a moon druid right now. <laughs> yeah. So I get that. The way that we kind of we're doing it is that when you roll to hit, you have to roll against a, a 
their uh, character's evasion. Mm -hmm. So if you decided you wanted to dump a lot of points in the agility, that adds to your evasion. So let's say you, you got your evasion pretty high, you know, maybe 16, 17. So if they roll and then they hit you, then you have your armor. So your armor is going to basically be a, a one point for one point damage soak, uh, depending if you have... Um, other things on it like bludgeoning resistance or something like that which will do additional damage reduction so because the numbers are going to be pretty ridiculous we wanted to make sure characters had it, uh, enough time to or if to be well prepared so let's say if you were running a ranger and you were worried about you know something getting through your evasion you can supplement with some armor but there are certain skills that require certain weapons and then uh, that you might not be able to use because of the type of armor you're wearing. So there, there's we're trying to keep it uh, everyone as relevant as possible. And the rangers, uh, you know, we have a, a like a marksman build where you're basically using guns and 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 bows of that nature. And then we have a trapper build, which is more um, I wouldn't say a support character, but uh, more kind of like. Um, setting traps like in commando with Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> except except they would they would roll these out kind of like a pokeball and then they, they would come out so it's more of like an instant trap a uh, punji stick a uh, death trap or something like that so you're able to be more strategic but also being able to immobilize enemies and doing a ton of damage yeah I I was actually gonna make the joke up first off the who I the character I usually tell people to use is a template when it comes to a ranger a lot of people would think, oh, oh, Legolas. No. First Blood, <laughs> Rambo. Yes, yes. <laughs> he, he, he killed the whole town of cops, man. That's the best ranger in existence. But it's, it's, more, it's more the fact that you, ha you have somebody who is... There's, there's this idea that a, that a ranger is supposed to be, is supposed, is supposed to be hang, hanging out in the distance and picking people off with the bow. Yeah. Exce except... That's not except if if you're focused on just that, then you don't have a ranger. You just have a sniper, and you yeah, can do a sniper with just about with just about anything. I've done mage snipers. But then again, I've, <laughs> you're right. I've also done I've also done mages who were who um who I've who I've described as ha as having um magic mervs. The idea is I've got a spell with your name on it, and I'm going to keep casting until I find it because <laughs> I. I wanted to see how many how many castings of um, magic missile I could get away with. The answer was 128 in one shot. Looks like a spaceship Yamoto, or just kind of or a Gundam show. You just got missiles coming from every orifice. Have you ever heard of the Atano Circus? No, I haven't. Um, uh, it comes it comes from Ita Itano's time in Macross. What's what some what some plebeians might refer to as Robotech, but. Fuck harmony gold. Um, it in a lot in a lot. You know how in a lot of those scenes you have this mat. You have this one scene that is this lengthy dogfight of dodging missiles. Yep. That is the that is the Atano Circus or the Atano Special. It he kind of pioneered that particular shot in cool. the same in the same way that um, Obari po popularized Brave Perspective or the Obari pose, which. I guarantee you have seen the Obari pose, even if you didn't know it. It's and that. It's that influential, huh? It is. <laughs> I had. I had a run. I had a running. I had a running joke where. I, where I had. I had said that. You that um. It's it's like it's like putting it's like putting it in um. It's like putting in a Wilhelm scream in in a in a in a, in, a, in an old school film. Oh, it's with the sword, the sword forward with the the character in the in the background. Yep. Yeah, I'm gonna do that when I get out of the shower tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, every, everybody everybody's made the joke, but like once you <laughs> once you see it, you can never unsee it. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm I just briefly Googled it, and I, oh my god, almost every anime show's got a scene in that showing that. Yeah, th that's how that's how influential this is. Almost like bullet time from the Matrix, right? I'd say if, if there's if there's anybody who's the, who's the inspiration for bullet time, obviously it would have been um, John, it would have been John Woo. But I one thing I the the one I will note the one game that used bullet time the best is Fear, and they they did not even hide that they had been inspired by the Matrix, but they also said that. One of the things they wanted to do was was do their own tribute to the tea house shootout in Hard Boiled. 
Oh. If you remember, if you remember that scene, it's not a case where there's where there's a few there's a few there's a few bullet ricochets here and there. No, the whole place is getting trashed. Just, just everything's getting wrecked. You've got, you've got, t you've got tea, you've got, ke you've got kettles and all, all that getting shot and just shattered. <laughs> it's, it is a, it is a chaotic, it is a chaotic mess of stuff. Really, looks really good on camera though. Mm -hmm. Well, that, yeah, and it's, and that, that was, and rule of, rule of cool should, rule of cool should always, should always trump when you're doing storytelling, unless it, unless it shouldn't. I Obviously. mean, I live my life by that motto, dude. <laughs> but if I'm not coming out of the house cool, I'm getting up and starting over. Well, <laughs> the now some something one thing that I th I think I I think I would have to ask is when it comes to when it comes to character and avatar, are they leveled separately or is it a sh is it a shared leveling experience? Uh, it'll be a, sh a shared leveling experience. So when you when you one when you go up with one, you'll go up with the other. So, um, and interesting about the commando, um, our bestiary is called uh, Creatures Compendium, mm -hmm. and Creature is actually one of the characters that is the key player in the world, and he's a commando. So, the bestiary is, is written like a diary of his uh, adventures in Gaia. So, he, he has jotted notes, and, uh, you know, even as much as how these monsters taste, because we'll have a, a pretty good crafting system as well. Mm -hmm. So, the monsters will have... Uh, Things that would drop on a percentile dice that would help you, you know, craft enchantments or weapons instead of just outright buying them. And um, so all the knowledge of these monsters comes from this one man. So he'll have these, uh, you know, uh, his lore and everything and where he finds them, the mating seasons um, and all that kind of stuff. And then with that, you'll have uh, where a certain fauna grows in case you want to cook a certain dish and all this kind of stuff. So he's, he's going to be, uh, you know, a story within the story. Mm-hmm. And it's de it's definitely going to be an interesting uh, ap approach. And I'm get I'm guessing that in order to, in order to help ease th ease things in, you do have a, you do have a sample adventure planned down the road. Yes, yeah, so we have uh, one called the uh, Prize in a Serial Box that's going to launch at the same time as the first module for entry level characters. And the brief gist of it is you, you wake up in the morning, pour yourself a bowl of cereal, some strain falls out, you touch it, and end up in a hospital. And so it spirals from there um, with uh, different ghost tech things and figuring out what's going on. And then you end up going back to the into the world of Gaia for the first time and getting your feet wet there. And then uh, finding that the thing that you actually had was some sort of distress beacon. And you come back to, the, to Earth and figure out the mystery behind it. But uh, we do plan on making modules for different uh, level groups to kind of push people through the world. And we have, um, I guess, like um, our key players is what we call them, certain characters that are very influential in the world. Like um, one is Cashier. He's the leader of the Backrooms. And the Backrooms is like a, um, a guild hall in the real world where people can go that are... Um, that have been to guy before and make parties and do things of that nature. So there will be a camaraderie with guilds and people forming groups up with each other and becoming famous within that community. Mm -hmm. And as far do you have it? Do you have a launch window in mind for for when for when this when you're going to be putting some of this out? Yeah, we should we should be ready for print in probably about three to four months, and then um, we. It's it's right now it's all coming out of pocket. Mm -hmm. So that was we might even try relaunching the Kickstarter in about three months uh, when we're ready for print. But if not, we will we'll find a publisher and then just doing PDFs or even print on demand. So we have a couple of things that we're we're working towards, and um, hopefully within that time frame we'll have something out. Mm -hmm. And I, I will certainly look forward to it. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Oh, it was a pleasure talking about everything. I get excited. Mm -hmm. I forget to breathe. <laughs> uh, and anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Ah, I have been. <laughs> And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, 
my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! Perfect. <laughs>